this really holds true for women and this is a line that i've heard dr usha shriram ma'am she is the mind behind this entire event and this is something uh, that dr shriram has always said uh, you know men and women are equal but not the same so that's kind of stuck with me and i don't remember how many times i've you know iterated this sentence again and again and again so we know there are gender differences in pathophysiology of diabetes and risk factors and also complications therapeutics and outcomes and we've just begun to appreciate these differences there are biological differences and also gender role related differences uh, now when it comes to complications we understand traditional complications we've learned about it the microvascular the macrovascular and so on but now we are understanding that bone is also intricately linked to diabetes and psychological health is intricately linked women have specific issues that you know come with the biological sex of being a female uh, so i think uh, this will become a very relevant topic and uh, maybe i'll address the first question for dr mala we know cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of mortality in people with diabetes but the common perception is that before menopause women are usually protected from cardiovascular disease that's the kind of general uh, you know opinion we have so when it comes to women with diabetes is the risk same as men lower than men or higher and what are the factors you think that drives this risk so yeah so uh, you're very right till very recently people used to think that all women were at less risk and in fact all the studies also if you look at our on target transcend they all showed that the risk in women was much less but what they did not do was the sub sub grouping of diabetic women when they started looking at diabetes women and men they found that diabetes women were getting the myocardial infarction or the atherosclerotic heart disease almost 22% some say 22 some say 35% more than the men and they were getting it earlier also so that is why now we say that men women are at more risk of cardiovascular disease in diabetes estrogen was thought to protect but that protection is somehow taken away in di with diabetes so in diabetes women are no no longer protected with the estrogen even in the when they are premenopausal so it's important to address this what is the risk so this is again uh, some factors the which are not known and some which are known like you have said they are sex specific or un, uh, under recognized but though the last line has not been said it is possibly the fact of uh the maybe at puberty itself apparently the heart of the woman is larger i i was just reading and i found it very interesting and the other thing is the waist circumference and things like that are much uh, or also contributing to the fact of increased risk in women yeah thanks ma'am for that uh sir madhu sir we say that heart failure is different and more common has poor outcomes in women what do you think are the drivers for this and are there any well established ways in which we can screen prevent treat because most of the trials have a significant under representation of women actually i mean if you look at the trial data it's more geared towards men okay uh thank you and uh, i think the first panelist dr mala has already set the stage by saying that coronary artery disease ischemic heart disease and stroke and all these things are more in women uh, against what was earlier believed if you have early onset ischemic heart disease you will also have early onset heart failure if, and if you have more of ischemic heart disease in women and that's the reason you know although the effect of estrogen is is off in premenopausal women once she is diabetic it still doesn't explain why it is more common in occurs earlier than men that is the issue so there are factors which we don't understand fully one of which she did mention a large heart at puberty or whatever so <laughs> so 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 if you start with a higher incidence or a higher prevalence of let's say ischemic heart disease then higher the rates of heart failure are also bound to be more so that one of the important things we need to understand the second aspect is again you see if in general women somehow have been found to have worse glycemic control 
may be not as well treated or may be well treated but not controlled, whatever be the reasons, whether they are scientific reasons or whether they are cultural uh, angles to these, the fact remains that uh, in general it's been seen that you know there's more longer duration of lack of glycemic control in women that could contribute to a higher um, incidence of heart failure in them in the long run because that affects the heart also in the long run cardiomyopathy and so on. The third thing that people have uh, also alluded to is that even the pre-diabetic stage is supposed to be longer in women and that also and we all know that pre-diabetes predisposes to coronary artery disease and heart disease in the long run also probably the diastolic and systolic function of the heart in general. This could be another factor which, which, which is responsible for a higher uh, heart failure incidence in women compared to men. Uh, there are many, in, some people also believe that you know the risk factors also deteriorate in women once you know the control goes off and so many factors but the final answer is not yet clear. But the fact remains, yes, heart failure is more often more seen in women and we need to be guarded, be alert to that possibility while we are managing a patient with diabetes. Yeah. So, in extension of that, sir, uh, so when it comes to women, you know, we now understand that fatigue is a common complaint and we often miss uh, heart failure when people are complaining of fatigue. Could it be that in women we are, you know, overlooking fatigue as a heart failure in women with diabetes and just saying, oh, she just remains tired, there is a psychological problem behind it. So for both of you, if you think that's the answer. Uh, I think uh, that is, especially if the patient has been coming to you and always saying, I'm tired. So you'll always say, oh, it's in the mind rather than a problem. Yeah. So I think we have to take them seriously. Yeah. It is true that the psych psychology also may be a part, but we cannot say that without ruling out whether she has heart failure. And I forgot to say, in type 1 diabetic women, the heart failure and the atherosclerotic heart disease is twice that of the type 1 men. So in type 1, we have to be that much more common. And uh, someone just mentioned, no, Sadesh, uh, she said something and she was given for anxiety, neurosis when she and landed up with an MI. So we had a person just documenting that just now. So this is very common that we may just brush off or the woman itself will brush off. She may not even go to the doctor saying, I'm tired and oh, everyone in the house says, okay, you're tired, you're doing work, something and not take her seriously. I find this a main problem. She herself doesn't take herself seriously and neither do her family take uh, her seriously. Yeah. So I think uh, these things we have to address. Yeah, so I think that's uh, what I feel is that women have a nature to nurture but they don't nurture themselves. Quite often they are nurturing other the household members and overlooking their own problems and we add to that, add insult to the injury. Uh, uh, Shaila, in line with this, do you think a PCOS could be a contributing factor? We see it so commonly in uh, women. I mean, we can ask yes. our experts. So, yeah. so at this point of time, PCOS is uh, known to be a problem which is not only I mean, is not only prevalent in adolescents. We are talking about PCOD as a metabolic disorder which has manifestations from adolescence to menopause. So, what do you think could be the influence of PCOS as far as uh, heart health goes? We all know that, you know, just like any other condition, PCO is one of the important uh, um, uh, conditions with long-term metabolic consequences in terms of uh, diabetes and cardiovascular health as well. So that probably is one of the um, angles and one of the um, um, uh, circumstances which leads to a higher risk of heart failure. So that is a factor we need to cons consider besides others. One of my postgraduates had done a study and we have published it also where the intima media thickness in PCO of women around 25 was already thicker than that of uh, the others, of, an, an, of a normal healthy woman. Uh, Can I just add a mic? Yeah, please. Aren't women also more uh, protein energy, malnutrition, malnutrient and also, you know, lack micronutrients and that could also be, uh, you know, contributing to the fatigue and we commonly think that that's the reason and not heart failure. Maybe what do you think? For some reach to not only that, even uncontrolled diabetes, it's, we tend to attribute everything to uncontrolled diabetes, so we often miss. 
I think uh, uh, what is being said is that fatigue, uh, heart failure can present only with fatigue rather than classic dyspnea. When someone comes with fatigue, we go through the whole, whole sort of nine yards. You have to check, obviously, if there's very poorly controlled diabetes, there may be hypothyroid, there may be deficient in D, there may be deficient in B12, they may simply be anemic. They may simply be anemic. And of course, what Mala was saying, there could be just stress related, you know. So there are definite causes, but despite sometimes screening for that when you get stuck or even otherwise, if the symptoms suggest definite relationship with exertion and, you know, just, just a feeling of tiredness, we are not so proactive in screening. For, for heart failure as we should be, either by doing a 2D echo or an NT pro VNP. And I think the understanding that there is so much heart failure in people with diabetes is only a few years old. And I think we need to revise our strategies for detecting heart failure early in people with diabetes. So in that sense, yes. But micronutrients are the first and by far most important cause. Yes. I think I think the yeah madam please please go on. I just want to add one point to what he was saying now about uh, screening with the NT pro BMP uh, because many times uh, they have diastolic dysfunction and uh, the ejection fraction on the echo is normal mm -hmm. and if you don't do an NT pro BMP you completely miss the heart failure and two more things one is microvascular angina uh, which is what we call as a syndrome X is much more common in women and what we call as minoca myocardial infarction with normal coronaries is also more common in women so maybe women present with heart failure with even normal coronary angiogram, uh, which could be because of either a microvascular angina or a minoca. Very true. Very true. I think very salient point. The, the message would be that, you know, often echo is often ordered even otherwise. And if you have some dysfunction listed there, at least in women be more alert to the possibility of a clinical pos uh, heart failure. That, that probably is the message. Yes. So one small question, Dr. Mala, in line with this. So SGLT2 inhibitors, we know, have a frontline role in you know, uh, CHF, but in women, and especially when you go to that elderly women already complaining of genitourinary syndrome, how do you place SGLT2 inhibitors and how do you ensure their safety? Uh, just now I heard Dr. Abhir saying it's very common to get genitourinary infection, but uh, from my perspective, I don't find so much. I do give uh, SGLT2 inhibitors uh, to quite a lot of my women with a lot of counseling. But yes, if they have such problems, I'll be a little hesitant and I'll tell them use it and if you're having recurrent problems, you have to stop it because we can't give one with benefit and have a side effect also. Yeah. So that's how I do yeah. that. So I think the message is we should not withhold them. Yes. But with proper counsel. So I certainly uh, think SGL2 inhibitors have changed the way we manage diabetes and their role in heart failure is unquestionable. And uh, the fact that they, uh, from in our, on our desk now, they're like uh, often the first prescribed drug or the second prescribed drug. Yes. So there's no question. And in postmenopausal women or women are absolute candidates for SGLT2. But we just need to be alert to the side effects and not dismiss them and say kuch nahi hai. So you don't want the, sometimes patient will not be forthcoming. You don't want a patient to be suffering with day-to-day -day side effects to prevent something that is, that is going to happen 15 years uh, later. Yes, so it's like metformin. Metformin is a great drug, but so many patients can't tolerate it. Yes, yes. And can't tolerate full doses. So you have to recognize that and reduce the dose. Very true. So from morning we've been having this conversation about inequ I mean, uh, inequities, differences in biological behaviors, differences as far as health behaviors are concerned. So can this really, you know, be taken up to the next level? Can this become something which can be taken up at the national level? And how would we go forward with the agenda that we have? That is the basic backbone of the entire meeting. And I would love any, I mean, anybody to really comment on this uh, after, sir. So I think this is, uh, obviously you've listed all the points there. So I really don't have to add anything. The fact is that there are biological differences, some of which we realize, some of which we don't know. With related to the heart, we don't really understand very well the, uh, the significant biological differences, except the fact that estrogen does seem to sort of protect the heart, but the molecular mechanisms of everything are not clearly understood as to what is the difference. I mean, we are not talking of, of, of bones and all, I'm talking of heart right now. Okay, so that is very true. The, undoubtedly, there is a difference in health behavior. We've been discussing that since the morning. And undoubtedly, there is a difference in access or prioritization of health care. So I guess all these could be factors. But perhaps 
much of this data comes from Western societies, where the gap is less, it's still there. The gap may be less, especially in, in, in certain segments of population, and still the differences seem to be there. So I guess there would be biological basis for the differences also. Why does diabetes take away the, that, that, for example, is, is not absolutely clear, or for heart failure, uh, and for the higher mortality, that also. So other way around, I'll just put in, throw in a point here, that obviously osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures are less common in men, but they have higher mortality. So what I'm saying is there are clearly uh, differences there. So I think we'll uh, divert a little from diabetes and heart. And uh, Dr. Kanchan, uh, we know cancer is, you know, now we're understanding that diabetes has a clear-cut connection with cancer. And especially in women, that's an important cause of morbidity and mortality. So uh, particularly, do you think there's a common soil here between diabetes, insulin resistance, and malignancies, and especially the malignancies like breast cancer? And uh, would the diabetes control impact or even obesity management impact cancer risk? Um, so first of all, thank you for having me here. I feel like a total misfit, a scalpel wielding surgeon amongst intelligent physicians. <laughs> but just before I answer this, I'd like to kind of, uh, you know, when we're talking of biological differences and ethnic differences, I've begun to believe God is racist. Everywhere I go, we hear Indian women get more, Indian women get it early, Indian women get it worse, you know. So, and, and it's the same with, with breast cancer. So, so, sadly, just very quickly to run through statistics, um, the past three decades have seen more than a 50% rise in breast cancer cases in India. In the Western world, breast cancer peaks in the fifth and sixth decade. In India, it peaks a decade earlier. In the West, breast cancer in young women under the age of 40 or 30 is 6%. In India, it is anywhere between 16 to 25%. We see more advanced breast cancers in India. And in fact, when I was in the UK, I did an ethnicity study where we saw that if you age match and stage match Caucasian women against Asian women, we are likely to do worse to the same form of treatments than the Caucasians do. So obviously, other than our attitude towards health, there are certain biological differences which we cannot always pinpoint which makes it all the more important for us to be more aware, to have a national level conversation. You know, there was a conversation around COVID which was made viral on media and even your maids knew the different types of COVID vaccines. So why not about non-communicable diseases as well? Because they are the next burden that Indian population is facing. So I think that conversation really needs to be had. So my pet peeve is out of the way because I always want to say this coming back to your question here. So I don't think there is a direct cause-effect relationship between diabetes and cancer. But things like obesity and diabetes are all related to health care, um, lifestyle attitudes, right? And cancer is a lifestyle disease. We do know in postmenopausal women, obesity is definitely associated with a higher risk of breast cancer because the circulating estrogen is more. Ironically, in premenopausal women, obesity may actually be protective against breast cancer. So, you know, it's very difficult to always pinpoint the reasons as to why. And you mentioned uh, about insulin resistance. In fact, there's been a study um, that uh, was published in, in Nature, which spoke about how intermittent fasting, where um, insulin-like growth factor levels are low in women with breast cancer, if they do intermittent fasting, their risk of recurrence is reduced by up to 40%. Um, so obviously, these are factors that are linked, and, and the, the biology of this obviously needs to be understood so that from the lab transition to the clinic and understanding whether we can actually you know, use this information um, to change the landscape of presentation of cancer and also treatments for cancer. I think that's very important. Also, women who are diabetic, especially those who have uncontrolled
rural diabetics, exposed to chemotherapy is a dangerous cocktail. So um, cardiac issues become significantly higher. And now with targeted treatments like trastuzumab, which directly affect the heart, we are seeing more and more of that. And this new branch of oncocardiology is coming up because um, women with um, diabetes, heart disease are facing more complications, um, you know, when they have cancer. So in fact, it's funny when I have women in clinic who tell me ki hum to meat nahi khate, hum ne to, you know, we have a very healthy lifestyle, I've never put on weight, I do pranayam every day, why did I get cancer? So I tell them, see, the fact that you did that will at least ensure that your recovery from treatments will be better. I cannot tell you you do this and you won't get cancer, but I can tell you if you get cancer, your recovery from treatments will be much better. Very true. Very well said, ma'am. Uh, can I take the next question to Sudha, ma'am? Uh, ma'am, we, we were just speaking about anemia, we were speaking about vitamin D deficiency. Should we advise all our women with diabetic patients to routinely be screened for these disorders? What do you think? How can we actually look after this problem? It's a national problem. How do we look after this problem both at the individual level and also what kind of noise can we make at the level of public health? Right. I think uh, anemia, we all know, is uh, much more common in women and uh, it has been recognized at the national level uh, that uh, the percentage of uh, women with anemia far outnumbers men. Uh, the ratio is about 50 to 20 like that. So 50 women versus 20 men would have anemia. And the uh, most common cause of anemia in women seems to be iron deficiency. Uh, in the lower socioeconomic group, we have a lot of patients who have worm infestation. Uh, where I work in Chennai with uh, Dr. Usha, I see a lot of women coming with anemia, uh, 3 grams, 4 grams like that. And uh, they just come with fatigue and sometimes uh, they come to us only when they have swelling in the feet and they are in cardiac failure. Uh, that's the way it is because like uh, the women are made to work even if they are uh, feeling tired and iron deficiency is the commonest and once we deworm them and put them on iron they are much much better and along with diabetes yes anemia is more common and uh, because i think i don't think there's a cause and effect as such it's probably because both the diseases are common and so you're seeing the association being more common uh, but where uh, uh, there is data to this effect, uh, you know, uh, there are studies which say that about 18% of diabetics have iron deficiency anemia. There are studies from Gujarat on that. And the national data, if you go to the national website, uh, there is one anemia mukt bharat. There is an initiative taken by the government uh, which talks about how we should uh, uh, rid the uh, uh, women and men of anemia. And of course, women in their reproductive age, sometimes they have, uh, uh, you know, menorrhagia, things like that, and uh, of course, poor nutrition. And definitely, uh, a diabetic woman is uh, already tired because of diabetes, and we are adding one more to the pot by putting the anemia in there. I think anemia is a low-hanging fruit, uh, much easier to control than diabetes. So I think we should go for it. Uh, the second aspect where uh, anemia has come up in a big way is the metformin associated B12 deficiency. Uh, one of my postgraduates in uh, Manipal is still working on it. Uh, we are uh, trying to screen people on metformin for B12 levels. And uh, especially uh, with uh, where I used to work, we used to have a population of vegetarian patients. Uh, not all of them are B12 deficient, but when they are diabetic and they have put on metformin, then most often they come and complain about peripheral neuropathy. They start saying burning feet and things like that. And then you screen them for diabetes. Yes, you find they are diabetic. Uh, but you also screen them for a B12 deficiency, uh, especially if they are on metformin. So I think the ADA also recommends that people on metformin should be screened for B12. So that's the second aspect that we should look for. And of course, during pregnancy and uh, the growing years, uh, there is a folic acid deficiency. And women who are either uh, type 1 and they are growing up or they are diabetic women, uh, we should supplement folic acid. Here again, the government has done a good job. Like uh, uh, there is a implementation program uh, for uh, adolescents with uh, adolescents in schools, 
they are being supplemented with iron and of course all women uh, who attend you know for uh, uh, maternity issues everybody is given an iron and a folic acid that uh, i think it's really a very good move by the government so i think uh, yes anemia is a problem and of course the last part is when you have uh, diabetic patients with uh, ckd chronic kidney disease uh, many of them will come with uh, you know eight nine like that and then you do the creatinine and you find that the creatinine is high and that's another part of anemia that uh, is often missed so i would put it in that order uh, iron then folic acid then b12 then the chronic kidney disease there is also a thiamine responsive anemia that has been published about in diabetics uh, which responds to thiamine uh, i have no idea of the mechanism but uh, all aspects of anemia are possible in a diabetic and you ask me about public health measures yes they have been addressed for iron and folic acid not addressed for b12 as such and regarding vitamin d uh, the the connection between vitamin d and diabetes has been variously studied so whether vitamin d is responsible for diabetes whether it's responsible for pre diabetes whether it's responsible for any complication in diabetes whether it will help cure any complication whether it will bring down sugar levels if you just open the net you will find some uh, 300 papers coming out of that but if you sit and read the data and you go through the papers you find that none of them is you know authentic uh, in enough to comment on it uh, because i think again these are two things that are common uh, vitamin d is very common vitamin d deficiency in fact as a practicing physicians is one of the things that saves us because when patient says i am feel, feeling weak and you don't know what it is you do one vitamin d invariably it will be low then you can tell oh this is the problem and so we give you vitamin d and you escape because nobody wants to be told that you know uh, there's nothing wrong with you uh, that's the last thing they want to hear from any doctor some wrong thing has to be identified and you will cure it uh, that's the dialogue that i think all of us know <laughs> so vitamin d is a savior <laughs> in that <laughs> in that true, thing but i am not aware of any uh, government initiative for vitamin d uh, i'm not aware of it i didn't come across anything but yes i think diabetic women being what they are uh, with uh, osteoporosis being common so i think vitamin d levels should be done in all diabetic patients true thank you ma'am for that wonderful insight just wanted uh, to add one other angle she's covered most aspects of or all aspects of anemia in, in general one thing we also need to uh, understand when a diabetic is also anemic especially has yes uh, uh, hba1c HBA1 is affected HBA1 by HBA1. the anemia even if it's an iron deficiency anemia yes. and iron deficiency anemia is quite common so when we are talking of targets of control and the patient is anemic we need to keep that in mind yes. i think uh, a practical way as you were saying ma'am because all these deficiencies are common uh, i think we have to obviously we always ask for a cbc because we in any case check checking kft lft the cbc is part of it even for interpretation of hemoglo uh, hba1c as dr madhu was pointing out uh, in addition for the others uh, it's probably impractical in the real world to measure b12 and d for everybody who comes with diabetes because as you very rightly said you want them to be replete in d but here there's no data to show that it makes such a big difference to the diabetes part of it so therefore it's probably safer to give a small dose of b12 which i think all of us patients always want something extra to to make sure that is b12 and d is covered in that small doses of d are important just make sure no one else has also written several kinds of vitamin d that's a challenge but nowadays also i'll point this uh, out here that there is more and more data suggesting that daily small doses of vitamin d are superior to the intermittent dosing that we have been using true so uh, and there are many pills which combine all of them yeah. so adding that would be a good thing but for the for the C, uh, for the hemoglobin you'll have to measure Yeah thank you so moving on to dr purvi uh, we now understand that sleep disturbances and obstructive sleep apnea also have a relationship with metabolic health and uh, you know my classical image of obstructive sleep apnea is a middle aged man with obesity uh, having osa i mean uh, in women do you think it is still a problem in women with diabetes and how can we in practical screen for it wonderful question uh, first of all very humble to be here with this in illustrious panel and moderators uh, yes sleep disturbances in general are much more common with diabetes uh, than without diabetes 
and uh, OSA is the commonest amongst them. Uh, as far as uh, uh, women are concerned, first of all, let's understand that OSA is associated with overweight, obesity, and uh, also bec and it leads to you know altered heart rate. Uh, even blood pressure and also uh, you know the reduction or decrease in the slow wave sleep as well as the REM sleep etc which on a chronic basis can lead to that internal inflammation and give rise to insulin resistance and further dysglycemia also now this is the reason why even uh, because of insulin resistance even lean people uh, with diabetes or uh, dysglycemia have OSA and OSA is nothing but the obstruction in the upper airflow, which uh, causes the uh, which causes the airflow disturbance because of the upper airway disturbance. And uh, uh, it's much more common in women. In fact, uh, the pre several studies have looked at it, and there have been varying uh, incident. I mean, uh, varying prevalence reported. However, in general, in all with type two diabetes, the prevalence is more than fifty percent. Uh, as far as men are concerned, one of the latest reports uh, said that in 2022 itself said that you know up to 63-64% of men with diabetes have OSA, while about 66% of women with diabetes have OSA. So it is a significant problem, and uh, it's definitely under recognized. All it's very very simple. I think uh, we just need to elicit a very good history. Ask for the symptoms. Snoring being the commonest, uh, even excessive daytime sleeping, or just the patient may tell you that there is a, a sleep, you know disturbed sleep or less, qual uh, not a good quality sleep that the patient experiences. Uh, plus observed apnea or observed uh, you know. Uh, abrupt awakenings through the night and uh, periods of uh, gasping and choking. All these may be self-reported also, but doesn't hurt if you ask the patient. So a good history is very important. Anthropometric measures, very, very important. Again, the uh, not just the weight, BMI, but also the waist hip uh, ratio or the waist uh, height uh, ratio as well can be measured. Plus is a very simple questionnaire called the stop bang questionnaire, which is which can be even implemented at the primary uh, care units, you know, it's that simple. It just stands for, uh, I mean, it has components of uh, uh, snoring, tiredness, uh, observed apnea, and increase in blood pressure, along with noting down the BMI, the age, the gender, as well as uh, the neck circumference. Uh, to And there is a good scoring also available, less than two means uh, you have very low risk of uh, OSA and above five definitely means that you need the more definitive test, something like a polysomnography, which is more expensive, probably hospital based because that's more definitive, uh, that can be looked into. So this is a relationship of uh, obstructive sleep apnea and diabetes. It has a bi-directional uh, relationship. and. Uh, as early as the nurses' health study itself showed that if you are a moderate, uh, you know, if you are an occasional snorer, then your uh, hazard ratio for developing diabetes is up to 1.4, and if you snore more regularly, then it's more than two. So, you know, right from then we know this close relationship. Thanks, thanks for that, Purvi. Uh, sir, I'm going to put this next question very simply: Why are women complaints not taken seriously? Is it? Uh, <laughs> Just very, very, I'm making it very simple, <laughs> one-liner question. Is it social? Is it cultural? Is it so even as residents, if a female patient complained for a longer time, we should write, we should write on the paper HYS. So, I mean, <laughs> what is it? I mean, why is it this? Nowadays, uh, if women make a complaint, they're taken more seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the past, so they're being heard more, and men are being ignored. <laughs> that that phase has started, so don't worry. <laughs> That's in general. Um, anything more specific? You want me to answer questions on mental health, or we'll, we'll yes, think about it later. Health, okay. I'll just yeah, uh, bring sure. in one point. I think it's purely economic. Okay. Uh, I think the breadwinner, so-called. Is generally the man and even if woman is working she is probably the secondary person in terms of income in families where the woman is a primary 
uh, economic contributor to the family, she'll get more attention than the man. The breadwinner. Okay. Okay, in terms of, you know, extending what you said, um, uh, the impact on mental health and psychological health, and is it um, that these problems are more often seen in uh, diabetic women, and are they important, and um, uh, what should we do about them? If we, if we address that question, I think it is well known that, you know, mental health is an important issue in all diabetic patients, particularly in diabetic women, because in w diabetic women they are seen much more often. Uh, Frank diagnoses of depression and anxiety are also seen much more frequently. In general, it's said that about, depending on the study that you look at, the depression rates in diabetes can be anywhere from 10-12% you know, to even 55%. And anxieties also can be a wide range. But the important thing or the bottom line is, whichever study you take, it's far more frequent in women as compared to men. In, even the distress is almost two or four times more common. Uh, in women because the, the way you handle the challenges of uh, living with diabetes also is far more difficult for a woman uh, because of various reasons including the socio-cultural factors and uh, some of the biological factors that you probably have listed uh, and therefore the distress itself is more and this uh, can often lead to a frank diagnosis. Uh, one important aspect is that it can impact not only mental health but it can also impact the diabetes control per se. Yes. And that's why we need to keep it a specific um, uh, understanding of this and manage that. If we don't manage the mental health part in the depression and anxiety, then not only will the patient's mental health continue su to suffer, but not the sugars will remain out of control and the complication rates will be far higher. It's been seen, in fact, yes. that the complication rates are higher in such patients and in women in general, especially those who have the distress. Therefore, we need to take them, take this seriously. Uh, in one of the studies, actually, we did in India, uh, because of the, we were talking of socio-cultural um, background, in fact, in Delhi, uh, in women, diabetic women, and we found anxiety rates, which we don't talk too much about anxiety, we talk about depression most often. The first two years of the diagnosis of diabetes, the anxiety rates are huge, very high, 40, 50 percent of women. Indian women in, in Delhi, they reported anxiety. Uh, and of course, after two years, the anxiety settles off. The depression rates are same, regardless of whether it's within two years or after two years. The, the uh, depression rates are just as reported elsewhere. But we need to consider anxiety as well. And the two or three important aspects for the anxiety was the distress that is leading to the anxiety. Whether they could fulfill their social roles with this new condition that they have to face is one of the serious questions that they have to address and that causes the anxiety and therefore if there is and if you don't get enough support for the woman at that stage probably it will it will um, progress to a more serious mental health condition True. so we so need to be very cautious of these aspects so one quick comment from dr mala and i have to move on to shiny <laughs> she's <laughs> also sitting here just wondering you know <laughs> Yes, so the fact. comment that I had to make, I agree with whatever Dr. Madhu said, but if you look at the society, the expectations of a woman are too high and expectations of herself are also too high. Right from childhood, uh, she is expected to, you know, look, whatever, work in the house as well, to help her mother and all that. When she gets married, she goes to a new uh, surrounding and for herself, especially today with working women, she feels she is neglecting her child when she's working. So huge amount of self-guilt is there. And uh, then again, when does she ever eat on time? You tell her, I have to wait for my son. He will come only at 10. So many things, you know, it's Very not exactly. easy. So I think that's where we all have to step in and see how we can support her in this journey. Because there is no answers to this. There's no right, there's no wrong. You cannot tell, don't wait for your son also. No, There's, These are certain sure. things sure. which we can't do. And apparently what the, they are saying is, if everything goes the way it is, it will be more three more generations where, we'll be, oh. uh, where men and women will become equal. So, <laughs> But I think we are trying yeah. to move that. Can I add a very faster. quick um, yeah. uh, comment? So, you know, uh, this narrative around um, uh, anxiety issues, depression issues, in, in patients who have chronic diseases and because we deal with cancer, even if we try to bring in formal counselors, culturally, 
as a society, we do not want to involve counselors. The moment we try to do that, there is so much resistance from the family. So I think the narrative around that also has to change if we have to formally address these issues. So Shaini, uh, what one, Just one point, <coughs> just one point here. See, in, in fact, the study which I was uh, quoting, you know, there we actually found that many women didn't really bother if their hb ones were high as long as they could fulfill their social or family roles. So the priority was that, as long as that was taken care of, they will also work for the sugar control, true, but, but uh, if it doesn't happen, so, so it be. You know, even this will be high and she's okay with that. But if anything were to happen in her fulfilling her role in the family, then that would trouble her most. Yeah. Totally agree. True. Yeah. So, yeah. Shiny, I would like to address this question. What kind of stress reduction strategies would you advise for women living with diabetes? Sure. Thank you. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, Dr. Usha, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here with all the seniors on the dais. And uh, stress, um, I'm a sports dietitian and I've seen that how exercise makes a big difference. Okay, we need to train like an athlete, but then even if you could manage to get out, get some fresh air. And uh, a lot of people don't like to go to the fitness center. So it could be yoga, it could be a dance, or it could be Zumba training. And uh, I even have a friend, my own trainer, who actually says for her weight training is like meditation. She's such a hyperactive person. And then she says, for me, only weight training, that one hour, for me, it's like moving meditation. So it could be playing with a pet or spending time with a child, um, any of these strategies. And it's, I'm glad that you brought up uh, mental health uh, because food and uh, mood has a connection. We all know how we feel when we have the chahaval or else a khichdi and post lunch sitting and you know, listening to a session, we all feel sleepy. So serotonin release. So now uh, we understand that even some of the individuals do have gluten intolerance, lactose intolerance, and we have seen clients, once we identify that and remove that, they actually feel much better. Their brain fog is gone. Their um, anemia, in fact, there's one of these angles where we had a client with unexplained anemia, and then when the food intolerance angle was addressed, they were able to absorb better. So even addressing cellular inflammation, giving the right kind of customized food, makes a big difference. So stress management, the definition could be, or rather the solution could be anything. Exercise or spending time with family or any of those. So it has to be individualized. Yeah. Yes, yes, it has to be individualized. Uh, Ma'am, if we can uh, ask you, well, because we are running short of time, so we'll just ask you, what is the role of MH MHT? Do you think MHT has a role to play? Uh, actually, this is we were, uh, <laughs> someone mentioned here the nurse's health study and the HERS study, and we pushed M uh, menopausal hormone therapy to the maximum. Then we got the WHI, and then we all went into our shells and stopped prescribing. But the truth is somewhere in between. So I think it's good when if you screen a patient properly. So just for the audience, menopause transition is when your cycles start becoming irregular to the day it stops. So at that time, I think it's the most important time to actually give estrogen and progesterone. And we know when to give estrogen and when to give estrogen and progesterone because we are running short of time. So uh, I, it is a good at that area. And like if you look at reasons for giving, possibly uh, vasomotor symptoms would be the best uh, to give. And if it is not placebo or any of the others, you could give. And whether you're looking at cardiovascular risk, earlier people used to think that estrogen progesterone will actually cause the blood glucose to go high. It is, studies have shown actually it does not cause it to go high. It will actually control. And there was a thing that may even prevent or delay. So there are, but there is no definite uh, thing. So now for uh, sec prevention, there is no uh, guideline. But yes, it may be thought to uh, give. Maybe the best estrogen to give would be a tissue specific estrogen. Uh, like the serms, which are now very specific to tissues, and there you would get more benefit than uh, problems related to all the other uh, side effects. Uh, so we all know that when we are assessing fracture risk in uh, women, especially with diabetes, the guidelines are different. Yeah. Can you please elaborate on that? Yeah, I think the recognition that people with diabetes, in particular women with diabetes, are at greater risk for fracture. Uh, the, the data is about 10 years, uh, 15 years, but now it has sort of 
uh, evolved into some more uh, solid guidelines. So one thing is very clear that we are not talking of type 1 here where the fracture risk is much higher because simply because of impaired bone formation. But in type 2 diabetes, typically the risk varies between 1.5 to 2 times fracture risk. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, that diabetics tend to fracture at a better T-score. So even a T-score of minus two may be sufficient uh, fracture risk for a person with diabetes, a woman with diabetes, than someone without. And that is because there, are, there is impact on the bone quality, there's impact on muscle strength, there's impact on neuromuscular coordination, there's impact on vision, increasing risk of falls, sarcopenia, you know, all those things happen. So, so that's two. Uh, so uh, the third thing is that all treatments that work for people without diabetes work for people with diabetes. Okay, these are the fundamentals. So what should we do about it? So first thing is that we need to ensure nutrition, as has been talked about, regardless of any test or anything, we need to make sure they're, they're not deficient in calcium, protein, or vitamin D. That's, that's you know, you don't need any, anything for that. Uh, the other thing is that you should ideally be screening people with diabetes, women with diabetes, definitely at the age of 50, instead of asymptomatic, instead of 60 as the, is the, often the recommendation, especially if they've had diabetes for more than 10 years. So anyone, the diabetes fracture relationship starts taking off a little bit at five years, but really it's established at 10 years duration. So 10 years of diabetes, 50 age, you ideally should do a bone density, and you should pay attention to a minus 2.2 T-score, a minus 2.3, which you normally would not have. And if you do these things, then, and obviously all the other things that are spoken about, the exercise, the diet, they will make a huge difference. Uh, exercise, if you don't fall, you don't fracture, by and large. So, so if, you're, if you're stronger that way, your balance is better, you will be less likely to fall and fracture. So I think this is an important area because our diabetics, Touchwood, are living longer now. They're, even though they're getting diabetes earlier, I see many, many, many more patients in their 80s and even 90s walking into the clinic sometimes uh, with maybe one attendant or not even that. So we never used to see that. So we have to look at that segment and that's when they start breaking their bones. So it's important that we start screening early and initiate preventive measures early. Yeah. So one short comment, Shiny, you wanted to add something. Yeah, could I just add two more points? Thanks for highlighting <coughs> exercise and nutrition. Uh, so what uh, we often miss is like, how many of you do weight training here? Show of hands, please. Weight training, how many times a week? Twice or thrice a week? Yeah, so most often what happens is when you ask any of our clients, how often do you exercise and what's the form of exercise, they'll always come up with walking. Okay. That's the easiest thing. I walk in my terrace, I walk you know, by the roadside or around the house, backyard. This is the answer. Or else they'll say, I'll do yoga. So weight training is something that is missed. And then when you do body composition analysis. So for the clients who can afford, we send them for DEXA once or twice a year. But otherwise, it is a body composition analysis machine. Uh, I, we do understand it's not very accurate. But still, it's done every time they come for a follow-up. And then uh, helping them understand that it's not just only about weight loss. You'll have to look at the body composition, increase the skeletal muscle mass. Once they get a grip over it, then the compliance is much better. Number two is the protein. So if it is a idli sambar or a dosa sambar, the sambar will be like, it's very watery in consistency, not a very thick sambar. Then we actually educate them to step up and include, you know, the mung chilla, basin chilla, dokla, khanvi, and then the sattu kaat, and in some cases, whey protein. If lactose intolerant, the plant protein comes into the picture. And then, of course, omega-3, so that their bone strength is uh, enhanced. Yeah. So, and sunlight. And so sleep. I think this is what we were going to anyways ask you. Uh, let's say vegetarian diet, how can they improve their protein quality and content? Okay, I'll just give you a quick diet chart. So the best will be to wake up and have a, a handful of fistful of nuts. So it could be 10 almonds or say 5 almonds, 5 walnuts and uh, drink some glass of milk. If lactose intolerant, you could have lactose-free milk or else you could try soy milk or almond milk or any of that. And then your breakfast could be basin chilla, moong chilla, or for a South Indian, it could be adai or peseret. Adai is nothing but a lentil or dal ka dosa. Peseret is green gram dosa, which is very popular in Andhra. So you can have regional wise, we usually give these recommendations, or else it can be eggs for a non-vegetarian. But of course there are, uh, you know, uh, lacto-vegetarians as well, so they're comfortable taking it. 
Now, of course, for lunch, if it is one cup of rice or say two rotis, then two cups of vegetables and one cup of thick dal, or else it could be chana, rajma, moat, lobia, any of that, or sometimes tofu, tempeh, and even that could be included. Next evening snack could be a handful of nuts or some soy milk, which is fortified with calcium, that could be given, or of course, um, a glass of milk is fine. And then dinner could be uh, soup and some cutlets, say vegetarian cutlets, rajma, chana, any of those black dal, everything is rich in calcium, so any of those can be included. And another factor is also to bring in seed mixtures, which can be uh, sprinkled on soups and salads. So a mixture of cucumber seed, melon seed, pumpkin seeds, and then also flax seeds will be good. Chia seeds and sabja seeds need to be soaked overnight, and then that could go into any of the milkshakes or maybe a smoothie bowl. So if this is done, and then also adding uh, flax seed oral sesame seeds, the black tilka would uh, we have the chickies, or else the til seeds can be powdered and added to the chutney bodies or the gunpowder that we have it with idli or dosas. So this is how a plan is given for a vegetarian, yeah. so ensuring that the... I'm going to start following from tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram. Yes. So I run a company called Art of Eating. Okay. And uh, during the pandemic, I started uh, communicating through my Instagram page. Okay. I had just 1,000 followers and I had no clue how to operate Instagram. But sitting at home during the pandemic, okay. my husband okay. encouraged me to take it up. And trust me, today there are around 33,000 people on my page. Mm -hmm. And this is the best way to reach. Uh, so my humble request to all of you here, to just start. hop onto Instagram. The, everyone is there. One of my young clients, a 12-year-old came and said, um, do you have an Instagram page? And I said, no. And he said, uh, only elderly people are on Facebook. So the next day I jumped in and <laughs> created my Instagram account. Yeah. I'm 46, but then the way the child said, I'm like, oh no. So Instagram, I'm sure initially you might find it difficult, but trust me, once you're on it, you, you can reach to communities yeah. across the world. So, so yeah, please go ahead. That's the best way to send the message perfect. across and in the regional language if possible. Yeah. So I think we'll take one minute per question just to wind up. Okay, uh, can I just Bunil. add to the Bunel thing quickly? Yes. You know, I think one aspect we also need to keep in mind, especially in postmenopausal women, fracture risk with more risk factors, is the use of uh, anti-diabetic agents. Ah. We, we sometimes tend to ignore that we should not use uh, glitter zones. Yeah. And canagliflozin also to some extent has been linked True. with uh, increased fracture risk. True. In general, SGLT2 are not totally overboard, I mean totally um, clean. Mm -hmm. So we need to be a little cautious no in their use. Yeah. So Dr. Totally. Purvi, uh, female sexual dysfunction, we don't really talk about it. It's common. Pe women don't seek attention and we don't have anything to offer also literally. So what is your take on it, how we can improve? So India has the you know, second largest population in the world, but talking about sex is completely taboo. And then sexual health is even, you know, even worse. Uh, so I think we need to sensitize our patients and have a little bit of empathy, empathetic uh, approach towards it so that they feel comfortable sharing some of the symptoms they themselves don't, are not self-aware that something like this exists or uh, you know they should seek help for it or it's a medical thing and they need to uh, ask for help. Secondly, a correct diagnosis is also extremely important because sometimes it may just be a transient phase. Let's understand sexual health in women or in anyone for that matter is not just a physical activity or the act itself, it's also lot more to do with physical fitness also uh, you know personal attributes or uh, emotional connect in, uh, interpersonal relationships psychosocial I mean so many factors impacted so all those taken together I think sensitization is most important besides that if the patient does come up with little hesitancy but still end up ends up sharing that uh, do ask them to maintain a, a satis uh, satisfactory sexual encounter diary uh, so that you can track it uh, at the next visit as to you know how many times it has happened and uh, there are uh, specific uh, validated questionnaires like the fs uh, fi uh, it's validated in indian languages as well we can use that and screen for fsd as well in our clinics i think in the interest of time ma'am we'll keep this as a last question uh Kanchan, ma uh, should cancer screening and cancer prevention be a part of diabetes care would such an approach help us and how can act women yeah. actually reduce their breast cancer risk? So I would have loved to say yes to the first part of the question.
but I tried to, you know, the NCDC program that the government has, so I tried to um, understand what they do for cancer. Because I found out that once a day in the local community, there is BP check and sugar check, which most uh, people will attend. But when I asked, what do you do for cancer? Sadly, cancer takes a back seat, especially breast cancer. Because the government will need to invest too much for breast cancer screening, diagnosis, and treatment. You're going to a healthy woman and telling her that you have a that could kill, you know. So, um, yes, if you look at it logistically, it makes sense for all non-communicable diseases to be carried through the same platform. But what I have realized working in the community with ASHA workers is that it's easy for them to talk about diabetes and BP and maternal health. They don't want to get into the realm of cancer. So a lot needs to be done in, in that sphere. And because in at least in my lifetime in India, population-based cancer screening for breast cancer is not going to be feasible. Um, the simple message about self-check, self-awareness, and the West may say, may crap saying that breast self-examination doesn't work, but a beautiful study by Tata over 10 years has shown that it definitely helps in improving long-term survival because early detection of breast cancer leads to very high rates of cure. In the West, 80 to 90 percent cure rates because cancer is detected in stage 0 and 1. In India, 1 in 2 women die of breast cancer within first 5 years of diagnosis only because it's detected late. So because I know we are running quickly, I'll tell you what I tell everybody to reduce their breast cancer risk. If you really want to do that, you'll have to stop eating, drinking and breathing. Because there are so many chemicals in everything around you. There are endocrine mimickers in your cosmetics, in your toothpaste, in the pesticides, in insecticides. So we don't know when it will happen and to who it will happen. But as a cancer specialist, I can tell you that if you detect it in time, it is curable. So. Thanks. Thanks. Try to make it short.